Hi, fifth graders, Ms. Shames here. Um, I'm gonna be reading aloud chapters 15 and 16 of One Crazy Summer, and then you all will independently read chapters 17 through 21. Um, so that's what you're going to be doing independently this week. So I just wanna recap what's been going on in our story. So Delphine, Veneta, and Fern have um, been going to People Center for breakfast every day and have been meeting interesting people there. Um, some are kinder than others. Um, the People Center is run by the Black Panthers and it's mostly Panthers and their children who are attending. Cecile explains that her new Black Panther name is Nzilla, which means path in Yoruba. We also learn that Cecile never got to ha have say in Fern's name, which according to the stories told about Cecile by Pa and Big Ma, is part of the reason why she left the girls. So it seems like names are pretty important in this book. Cecile has not been very warm or loving to the girls and won't let them go um, into the kitchen. And that's like still pretty mysterious about why. She won't let the girls use her phone and she makes them go get Chinese food for dinner every night instead of cooking for them. She had a group of Black Panthers over at the house and it seemed like they were pressuring Cecile into letting them use some of her supplies. So let's get started with chapter 15. And here's some of the lenses that we're gonna be thinking about as we read. So we wanna think about the characters, um, their relationships with each other, their traits, um, we want to think about how the narrator, narrator feels about story elements. We want to think about some themes that might be emerging. Um, and we want to look for changes in the characters, the plot, the setting, or a possible theme. Counting and skimming. I took a bar of ivory soap and one of Cecile's washcloths and scrubbed away at the black ink scrawled all over Miss Patty Cake. Um, so if we remember when we left off, Ven Venetta and Fern got into a fight and Venetta had drawn with a marker all over Fern's doll, Miss Patty Cake. Big Ma taught me to be a hard washboard scrubber, to not accept dirt, dust, or stains on clothes, floors, or walls, or on ourselves. Scrub like you're a gal from a one cow town near Prattville, Alabama, She'd tell me while Vanetta and Fern ran around and played. Can't have you dreaming out your head and writing on the walls. That'll only lead to ruin. I grabbed Miss Patty Cake's dimpled arms and chubby legs. I went after her cheeks and forehead. I scrubbed every blacked up piece of plastic, wearing down that ivory bar from a nearly full cake to nearly half flat. I scrubbed and scrubbed until my knuckles ached. It was quite a job. When Vanetta picked up that black magic marker, she had been determined to make Miss, Miss Patty Cake as black and proud as crazy Kelvin wanted her to be. I soon found it, I soon found it didn't matter if I scrubbed like a gal from a one cow town or if I gave up on ivory soap and turned to stronger cleaners. While the heavy duty cleaners and scouring pad lifted the black from the white bathroom sink, Miss Patty Cake's body was another story. The magic marker ink seeped down into Miss Patty Cake's soft plastic skin. At best, the Ajax, Pine Sole, and Scouring Pad left Miss Patty Cake gray, scratched up, and strong smelling. Hard scrubbing or not, there was nothing more I could do. Miss Patty Cake would never be Fern's baby doll the way she'd been as long as anyone could remember. I shook all the water from her insides, dried her off, then put her in my suitcase to spare Fern from seeing her baby doll all grayish and ashy. So I'm growing the idea that Delphine is a mature caregiver. Um, she shows her little sisters a lot of caring and she's trying to heal um, a, an argument that they had. Um, and I'm thinking that the baby doll might symbolize, and you know, we can think about symbolism as we're reading, especially in fifth grade. And I think the, the doll might symbolize like Fern's 
as a child, like her kind of like her past life um, that she's growing out of. So it's like the childlike essence of her. And maybe now she's growing past that. She's maturing. I was too tired to try to make this thing between Veneta and Fern wilt away. This wasn't exactly fighting over who gets the gold crayon or the last cookie. I knew better than to look for help from Cecile. Worn out, I began to see things like Miss Big Ma did. There was no point in flying us across the country for next to no, no mothering. I just kept counting down the days. The best that I could do was keep Vanetta and Fern separated. Vanetta bathed by herself and Fern bathed with me. Vanetta slept on top of the daybed and Fern slept with me below. Fern no longer looked for her doll when we left Cecile's for breakfast. I wouldn't say Vanetta did Fern any favor, but maybe things worked out the way they had to. Still, Vanetta remained proudly defiant, walking two steps ahead of us, then leaving us all together once her new friends, the Inktons, were in sight. She and Janice, the middle Inkton, threw pebbles at Hirohito Woods and fussed over who hated him more. So I'm noticing like we're learning a little bit more about Vanetta and it seems like she's not showing any remorse or guilt, sorry, that should say guilt, um, about what she did to Fern or her doll. And she's just eager to spend new time with her friend. So she's not showing a lot of caring or remorse. For snack time, Sister Pat passed out grapes. After we ate our fill, Sister Mukumbu gave us a lesson on the California grapes that we had just eaten and how their migrant workers who picked them had to fight for their rights. I don't think the lesson went the way Sister Mukumbu had planned. Everyone felt badly for having eaten the grapes. The room was quiet. Then Sister Mukumbu announced free time for the next hour. All the kids went wild at the prospect of running around in the park for an hour. But Fern and I didn't feel like running with them. Sister Pat had classes at her college and had to leave. When all the kids except Fern and I ran out to the park, I asked Sister Mukumbu if she had any chores or if she needed help in her classroom. Not that I wanted her embarrassing me, having me stand up front, rotate around the sun. It just felt strange, my Timex ticking and me having nothing to do. If only I'd thought to bring my book with me. A lot of good Island of the Blue Dolphins did me snug inside my pillowcase. Sister Mukumbu rose immediately. She had just the thing to keep me busy until the class came together for arts and crafts. She asked Fern and me to count the Black Panther weekly newspapers, stacking them crisscross every 50 copies. She said the older kids would take them to the local stores or sell the papers themselves. She made it sound like we were doing a great service by helping the newspaper carriers become more organized and accountable. It just gave me something to do, and Fern a reason to stick with me. Poor Fern. She didn't have the knack for counting. She was still angry and heartbroken about Miss Patty Cake. She couldn't get past 20 copies without losing her place and had to start over again and again. My stack of papers grew while she had yet to count out her first 50. Can't we just go to the park and play? She asked. I was tempted to let her go, but said, Come on, Fern. We have to get this done. All you have to do is count out ten and lay them this way. Then count another ten and lay them that way. I felt Sister Mukumbu watching as I showed Fern the shortcut. You know when someone's eyes are on your back and whether it's in a good way or a bad way. I felt her watching us in a good way. Soon, Fern caught on counting and crisscrossing. Her stack of papers began to grow. Not as high as mine, but it grew. Fern was now busy and not missing patty cake for the moment. After a short while, I felt Sister Mukumbu's eyes leave us. She must have figured we were all right and had continued doing her own work. Since the Black Panther newspaper cost a quarter, I told myself I'd only skim the front and back pages as I stacked the papers. I would read what I could see. If I knew I flipped a page over and read it line by line, I was officially reading someone else's paper, or as Paul pa would call it, stealing. 
So we're learning that Delphine is like really honest. Um, she doesn't even want to do the wrong thing, even when nobody's looking. Um, so let's see how that aspect of her develops. I skimmed the front page of every five copies. I got into a real rhythm, counting and reading a few words at a time. There was more artwork than printing on the front page, so I couldn't read much. One thing was for sure. I'd know Huey Newton if I ever saw him on the street. You couldn't help but see Huey Newton all over the newspaper. His face was cocked slightly in the upper corner of the paper, like the president's face on a dollar bill. Now the Black Panther leader was in prison where he belonged, according to Big Ma. As I counted, I dug Huey's corner picture, him wearing his beret looking cool and revolutionary. I flipped open a newspaper quickly, skimmed the article in five seconds glance at a time, then flipped it closed. The article was about Huey talking about Bobby. That's Bobby Seal. There was also a photograph of people protesting that I wanted to get a better look at. So I just wanted to back up for a sec and um, this part that Big Ma thought that Huey Newton should be in prison really stuck out for me. And it kind of goes with the idea that Big Ma doesn't really like the revolutionary black spirit. Um, we noticed at the airport, she didn't want to approach um, the black girls with afros. She wanted someone who was wearing a suit. And she's saying that she thinks Huey Newton should be in jail. So she's not with this like revolutionary spirit that the Black Panthers um, have. But it also seems like Delphine is really interested in really wanting to learn more about what's happening in these newspapers. There was also a photograph of people protesting that I wanted to get a better look at. They were people carrying the same kind of signs that we had colored in. Those could have been our signs. We were probably part of the revolution. Wouldn't that make a fine classroom essay? My revolutionary summer. I wanted to read the newspaper, not skim, not steal. I wanted to fold a paper over, sit back and read every word. So it seems like Delphine is like pretty excited to be part of the revolution. Um, you know, she's excited that her signs and things that she's doing are getting part of these protests. But I'm kind of wondering how, how that's gonna work down the road since Miss Big Ma um, has very different opinions. So I wonder if, you know, Big Ma will find out. I'm wondering if this might be a future conflict. I must have lost count. I was too busy imagining a Black Panther carrying our free Huey sign. Too busy to notice my neat stack had grown into uneven bundles with either more than 50 or less than 50 newspapers. Sister Delphine, Sister Makumbu stood before me with a smile on her face. Nuts! Fern said, because Sister Mukumbu's voice had startled her, making her lose count. She began to recount. Yes, Sister Mukumbu, I answered weakly. I hadn't even heard her get up from her chair or felt her eyes on my back. It wasn't like me to get lost like that. Do you want to read a newspaper? And embarrassed. I am not the kind to be embarrassed. Thank goodness she was a teacher and not some boy who could read the thoughts spinning in my head. I nodded my yes, which only felt worse since I was not a nodder. I dug out my two dimes from last night's change. I'll bring a nickel tomorrow, I said. She smiled and said, 20 cents will be fine, Sister Delphine. You're entitled, entitled to the worker's discount. I was too embarrassed to say thank you and gave her another nod. I took my newspaper and folded it twice to read about Huey, Bobby, and the protesters later. Now, instead of having two of the ten dimes needed to call Pa and Big Ma, we were back to having no dimes. Fern and I kept counting and stacking. Chapter 16, Big Red S. That night, Fern complained about her aching stomach. She meowed and howled and turned in her sleep. Go sit on the toilet, I told her. She clung to my side, meowing and howling. Vanetta yelled, quit it, Fern, I can't sleep. 
I paid her no mind and neither did Fern. If Fern couldn't sleep, then we all couldn't sleep. So too bad for Vanetta and too bad for me. I just let Fern carry on while I rubbed her stomach. It took a while, but she finally fell into sleep. Before we left the center in the morning, I asked Cecile for food money for tonight's dinner. If I could hold on to $200 over 3,000 miles, I could hold on to a $10 bill for a few hours. Cecile didn't bother with any questions. She just gave me the $10 bill and a door key so she wouldn't have to get up and let us in. I think anyone standing in the front door made her jumpy. So this is kind of confirming our theory that Cecile is very cold and unloving. Um, she kind of just handed her the money. She gave her key so she wouldn't have to get up. She's just not warm. Even when we ate on the floor in the living room, I'd catch her eyes shift to the door when she heard a noise. Maybe she thought the Panthers were coming back to bother her for more ink and paper. I was glad Cecile handed over the money without fuss or questions. That saved me from lying about getting shrimp lo mein when I had no intention of going to Ming's. Vanetta, Fern, and I had eaten our last plate of shrimp lo mein and egg rolls for the rest of our crazy summer. Shrimp and noodles swimming in sauce and deep fried egg rolls had taken their toll on us. Not that mean Lady Ming would cry for her three colored girls. She had other customers to yell at. All day long at the center, I could think of nothing else but a home-cooked meal. We marched to Safeway, the Safeway store after paying, playing in the park for an hour. My shopping list was burned into my brain. I think that means like she's memorized it. It was not literally burned in her brain. I picked up one head of cabbage, 17 cents, one onion, 8 cents, two potatoes, 23 cents, one package of chicken thighs, and one package of wings, $1.47. The price of chicken would have been thievery of the highest kind, according to Big Ma, who raised chickens down in Alabama, and only had to go pull one up. Um, before I turn the page, I just want to mention that I'm noticing Delphine is becoming more and more mother-like. Um, and she's very mature. So she's going grocery shopping for her and her sisters, and that's usually something that adults do. And it looks like she's planning on making dinner for the family, which is also something adults do. And I'm also noticing that she's kind of keeping track of how much everything costs, knowing that she only has a certain amount. So it's very mature and adult-like. And only had to go pull one up by its neck, kill it, pluck it, clean it, and fry it. Lastly, but most importantly, I dropped a can of stewed prunes into our shopping basket. 49 cents. There was plenty of money left over to call Pa and talk for as long as we wanted. Vanetta and Fern pouted as the groceries went into the basket. There were even a couple of, ah, shucks, and finger snapping as our dinner was placed on the ca cashier's counter. All the sniping between Vanetta and Fern over Miss Patty Cake was now aimed at their new enemies, the real food that we would eat until we returned to Brooklyn, and me. I paid for the groceries and put the change in my pocket. I'd give Cecile the dollar bills and keep the coins for our telephone call to Papa. Why can't we have pizza? Vanetta moaned, or shrimp lo mein? Because, I said, enjoying my role as their enemy and big sister, that's not food for everyday eating. I held up the brown bag, safe, brown paper Safeway bag with its big red S printed smack in the center. This is. So I just wanna say I'm noticing that Delphine is, it looks like she's taking some pride in being this mature, big sisterly role. Um, wow, I'm having trouble typing today. I'm so sorry. Um, so like, She's feeling proud in spite of, or maybe even partially because of, Fern and Vanetta not liking it. Like, she kind of enjoys that they are feeling a little mad about it because it makes her feel more in charge. Um, and also, just a little background knowledge, Safeway is a common grocery store in California, similar to Key Foods, like in Brooklyn. Big Ma would have been proud of me, but also angry that I allowed it to come to this. I'm sure she expected this kind of living from Cecile. 
From me, she expected better. Fewy. Double fewy. They could fewy all night for as long as I cared. For all I cared. Fanetta said, I hope you know she won't let you cook that. Not in her kitchen, Fern said. So I said, then she'll cook it in her kitchen. Papa's voice poured out of my mouth like warm, steady tap water. When I put the key in the door, I said, go wash your face and hands real good. Play go fish until I call you for supper. Cecile wasn't in the living room, which meant she was in her kitchen. I didn't want Vanetta and Fern to see how afraid I was of Cecile. I thought of how she planted her body between us and her kitchen door, daring us to take a step further. That she'd rather let Fern dry up of thirst than give her a glass of water with ice. I thought about how crazy Cecile was and that I didn't know her or what she'd do next. Now that I could smell the cabbage and onion from the brown paper bag, I lost that feeling of being calm and brave like Papa. I didn't dare walk in, so I called to her, Cecile. It didn't occur to me to use her poet name, Nzilla, to maybe soften her up, but that name didn't feel right coming out of my mouth. I dreaded this moment, dreaded the thought of her sweeping the kitchen door and seeing me with a bag of uncooked food. There was no putting it off. I called to her again, this time louder, Cecile. Her hand slapped against the counter or tabletop good and hard. In a, few mo in a few stomps, the door swung open and she was looking down at me. I took a step back and hugged the bag. I have to cook supper. She stared down at me and didn't speak. I didn't know what to do or say, so I took the change out of my pocket, all of it, and held it out to her. She took it, dropped it, and dropped it into her pants pocket, maintained her long, hard stare. If that was supposed to make me feel afraid, stupid, and small, it worked. Then she spoke. Why don't you go to Ming's or Shabazz? We have a Shabazz in Brooklyn, the fish and bean pie place run by the black Muslims. I found my voice and said, we can't eat takeout every day. Vanetta and Fern can't stomach it. You can't come in my kitchen making a mess. This is my workplace. I don't need you in here turning things upside down. I said, I don't make messes. Without a lick of sass, I spoke the plain truth. I'd never make a mess in my life, not even for the fun of it. Cecile went stopping and cursing back into the kitchen. No one told y'all to come out here. No one wants you out here making a mess, stopping my work. I stood outside the kitchen with the Safeway bag held tight to my chest. I'm sure the Safeway S was in the same spot as Superman's big red S sewn to his costume. I felt right looking out for my sisters, but I didn't feel brave. All the same, I didn't want Vanetta and Fern to see me standing there like a scared dummy holding a bag of groceries. So I noticed, like, I think it's interesting, um, the big red S, that was also the name of this chapter. So I think there's some symbolism for Safeway, and then um, Delphine compares the S to the S in Superman. And I think it's showing, it's, or it's symbolizing, that she feels brave in going grocery shopping, in looking after her sisters, and she almost feels like a Superman. I noticed that she doesn't feel fa brave, but she's being courageous. So you're courageous when you do something brave, even though you're scared. Cecile pushed the door open. Get a speck of grease on my work, you hear? So we've noticed um, in this part that Cecile is referring to the kitchen as her workspace. So I'm kind of like wondering what that's about. Like what work does she do? Because we know that she wants to keep it secret. So we kind of are wondering What's the work that's happening in the kitchen? I knew better than to wait for a nicer invitation and walked inside Cecile's kitchen. It was larger than our kitchen back home. Hers had both the cooking area and an eating area, which hadn't been set up for eating. There was a long table, only one chair, hers, and what I figured was her printing machine on top of a table. I didn't want to be caught gawking at her and her stuff. 
I went straight to the sink and started stripping the onion. Washing the cabbage, washing potatoes, washing the chicken parts until I could figure out what to do next without having to ask to seal a thing. She, sh she hovered over her machinery, grunting and cursing. Then she got up, pulled open a drawer, and threw a potato peeler and a knife in the sink. The knife just missed my hand. She didn't look once, but said, Don't go cutting off your fingers. There's no money to take you to the hospital. Wow. Um, that was a big noticing for me. Cecile seems very angry. She like, threw a knife towards her kid and said, um, don't chop off your fingers. But she didn't even say that out of care or concern. She's saying, like, we don't, I don't want to pay for it if your finger comes off. So very unfriendly and angry. I felt her watching me at work. Thanks to Big Ma, I could skin a potato with a paring knife without wasting a scrap of, potato, of white potato. I could cut up a whole fryer, too, even though this time I didn't have to. Cecile grunted. What you gonna do with that chicken? I said, bake it? Frying's faster, she said. I pointed to her papers. Grease. Papa's easy voice just slid right out of me, warm and steady. I could feel myself coming back, my voice, my steadiness. What you gonna do with the potatoes? Boil them with the cabbage and onion? Hmm. There was something about being here with her in the kitchen, and I knew what it was. I had a flash, a flash of us, quiet and in the kitchen, pencil tapping and her voice chanting. I blinked that flash away. I didn't have time to be pulled into a daydream. I kept doing what I was doing, and then I pressed my luck and asked her for some fat back. Another grunt, no fat back, no salt pork, no pig of any kind in my kitchen. I shook my head. People in Oakland were touchy about pigs. They were touchy about the pig on their plates and the pigs, as Crazy Calvin called them, in police cars. Back in Brooklyn, Big Ma wouldn't stand for cooking without pork on a Sunday. I couldn't even imagine Cecile and Big Ma sharing a kitchen or living in the same house. So I noticed in this section that Delphine is like making comparisons between like the culture in Brooklyn and the culture in Oakland. Um, you know, noticing that in Oakland, the people are really, you know, kind of against pigs in different forms. And that's different than her culture in Brooklyn. Since there was no pork, I used what Cecile had. Butter, salt, pepper, plus the onion. It didn't smell like Big Ma's kitchen in Brooklyn, but it was the aroma of real food cooking. Now that I had our dinner underway, I wanted to take in Cecile's place of work, see what she was doing hovering over her machine quietly, carefully. From where I stood, stealing glances, it seemed like she was laying down puzzle pieces picking up one piece of something and laying it carefully down on her equipment, picking up another piece and laying it down. Then she'd study the pieces, just the piece that she had completed. She had pulled herself into a puzzle laying and had forgotten I was there. Pulled herself into puzzle laying and for forgotten I was there. I could see why Vanetta and Fern were not allowed inside Cecile's kitchen. Cecile was fixed in prayer, I was allowed to be there, but I didn't dare clear my throat, let alone ask her to show me what she was doing. Vanetta and Fern didn't have the sense to be quiet. So it seems like Cecile's really focused in something, um, and that's why she doesn't really want them there, especially the younger ones. We spread the tablecloth on the floor and sat cross-legged as if we were eating mean, mean, Ling, mean Lady Ming's takeout or fried fish from Shabazz. While Vanetta and Fern ate begrudgingly, Cecile cleaned her plate and left three blanched chicken bones. This don't take like, taste like Big Ma's, Vanetta said. Surely don't, Fern followed. We should have got pizza or shrimp lo mein. Cecile reached onto Vanetta's plate and took the thigh that Vanetta had left. To me, she said, that's gratitude for you. I didn't care that they were ungrateful. I told my sisters, get used to eating like this. Vanetta said, I'm going to tell Big Ma and Papa. To them, I said, tell. 
When we were done, Cecile handed me every plate after she'd eaten whatever Vanetta and Fern had left. You started this mess, Delphine. You clean every dish and spoon. We had eaten with forks, but I wasn't about to correct her. I just took the forks while Vanetta and Fern disappeared into our room. At least I could tell, I could look Pa in the eye and say, yes, Pa, I did what you said. I looked out for my sisters. At least I got Cecile to let me into her kitchen. Then she added, and don't expect no help from me. I said, I don't mind. She gave another hmm and a head shake. We were trying to break yolks. You're trying to make one for yourself. If you knew what I know, seen what I seen, you wouldn't be so quick to pull the plow. I sort of knew what she meant, but someone had to look out for Vanetta and Fern while we were here. I stacked the plates in the sink and ran the hot water. It wouldn't kill you to be selfish, Delphine, she said, and moved me out of the way to wash her hands. Then she went back to praying over her puzzle pieces. All right, fifth graders, that's it for my read aloud section. Um, you're going to go on, like I said, to read chapters 17 through 21 this week, um, and then you'll answer the comprehension questions and the exit ticket. Um, I hope you're enjoying your summer and that you're staying safe and relaxing and having fun and that you're keeping up with this book and some of your I-Ready math. Um, talk to you later. Bye.